Uh, I want to start off talking about uh, one of the major themes um, that seemed to come out of this residence, residency for me. Um, my a friend from college, Terry Edmonston, um, I'm 48, so this was a few, dec three, yeah, a few decades ago. Um, she was a fellow artist, and she finished school and got a job at like Disney mag Magazine doing layout and things like that. And then she sort of like more the concept side. And then she more, I'm going somewhere with this. She, um, she liked the, she just seemed to like the management side. And then she went to school for management and is now like working for corporations and such. I've lost touch. I don't know what she's doing now, but, um, but I always admired that. Um, it wasn't that she went with the flow. It was that, it was that she was able to, to, look at how she defined herself and it's um because i mean this is very common in the arts you know if you, you're like i'm an artist and like years later you might not even like doing art anymore but you've taken on that identity you're like i'm an artist and it can be like i'm in this relationship this is the relationship that you know this is, defines me this job defines me this faith defines me but the thing is is those are choices and you don't have to question them. If they're comfortable, you can stick with them. Um, but also, as circumstances change, uh, I think it's valuable to think, like, what, like, who am I? Um, I often ask myself, if I had sort of unlimited resources, what would I be doing? And um, more often than not, my answer is I'd be living a quiet little life making comics. So I'm... I've worked really hard to, um, to build a life that, that makes me happy, that excites me. And um, so anyways, uh, I'll go more on that theme, theme later uh, as, I, as I go along. Um, I have uh, sort of notes and I sort of put them in order. Um, so I, um, my proposal for this residency was largely to, to do writing. Um, as a cartoonist, a lot of my comics are daily work and they're things where I know the characters, I know how to write a gag, I know the patterns. And I wouldn't exactly call it a rut, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's familiar. It's hard to break out of those patterns once they're established. And so I've, I've worked really hard to, um, to keep things fresh, but, but you just, in the day-to-day, -day, it's so hard to have objectivity. And so this was just a wonderful opportunity to I managed to get all my work done before coming here, and I could just write, and I could experimentally write, and that was the whole idea as well. I mean, I also wanted to do a short comic about about my experience, and I'll go into that as well. Um, but of course, when I got here, I'm like, well, what does writing how you don't normally write look like? And who who knows? Because you don't, you, it's not how you write. So so uh, it was it was just blank for like three days. I just sat there and stared at the wall, and um, and I tried to write and not write. And um, and then eventually I pulled up some old projects and I just started writing on them while keeping this question in mind: like, how do I expand how I write? How do I explore new ways of writing? How to explore new voices, new ways of telling story? Um, and eventually, after about uh, a week or so, um, the, I was away from my routine enough that things started sparking up, and I started taking all these notes about story, about character, about humor, and like, and uh, and that was just so wonderful. Um, and then I started transitioning into making a comic about my experiment experience, and then there was a fire, and I was um, I was uh, I don't know if I'd call it evacuated as much as, much as relocated. Um, so the bio station is a wonderful organization. Um, I was at another field station, uh, uh, say 10, which is in Truckee, California. And there's basically two administrators and one groundsman. And that's kind of what I was expecting, this sort of wilderness experience with, you know, this very hands-off approach. But like, they have like 30 interns at least, like this whole staff, this whole education, people coming in and out. They're always doing these expeditions to get samples and up in for days up in Glacier. And, uh, and it was amazing. Um, and they were extremely welcoming, and they gave me a really good space to work. Um, sort of a double room, like one room where I had my bed, and I set up my computer stuff, which I didn't want anything to do with. And in the other room, a desk where I just had my notebook. And I would look out the window at the lake and just write and work. And, um, 
and it was wonderful. And I also wanted to be engaged because part of the reason I wanted to do the Flathead Lake Biostation was because scientists are just great. They're like, they're curious. They're like, they, they want to help the world. They want to like add to things. And it's not, it's not like commercially capitalist based like every other job out there. Like they, they, you know, it's, they want to add something to the human experience and maybe save all our lives because who knows what's happening with the environment. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, they're just wonderful people, and um, they're very busy, so I had to sort of, you know, work a little to say, like, hey, you know, I want to check out this lab and, you know, and, and get a tour. Um, uh, I'm terrible with names. Um, Adam, who runs the Sensor Space Lab, is, like, this mad genius. He's like, he's like, do you know what this white powder is? And I was like, I don't know. Is it, like, I don't know, cocaine? And he's like, he's like no, it's more valuable than cocaine. This is, like, how much per gram do you think? I was like, I don't know. And he's like, like a thousand dollars. It like scientists can use it to refract light a certain way or something. I, I don't even remember. It was this this, this wild explanation. Um and uh and I was like, well this baggie is just like sitting on this desk. And he's like, oh we figured out a way to make it for eleven dollars a gram. But <laughs> but he's like, but there's no there's no market. There's only like two scientists in the world who need this. Um and he was just wonderful and his excitement, his exuberance was just was just great, and then um, and then Adam, who runs the uh, the uh, freshwater lab, is uh, he's definitely more structural. Like he's always networking, like what what agency needs work, what um, you know, what scientists are looking to do some work there, or what work they can they just do there for other scientists. They have some very specialized um, equipment. Um, Flathead Lake has extremely low phosphate levels, and um, and so when they would send tests of their send their water off to get tested to test for phosphate no one could test it because they could only test within a range because most rates almost all lakes are within this certain small range of phosphates um, but theirs was like way down here so they had to create these really specialized equipment and uh and i don't know just meeting these people were just fascinating and inspiring and i had more lined up um I was going to meet with, with Paul, who's been reintroducing a native ground squirrel and studying spiders as well, and Art, who um, he's, uh, he's worked a lot with uh, artists and residencies in terms of scientific field stations. Um, I was going to go out with uh, Jim, who I referred to the other, as the other Jim, because Jim, Jim Elzer is the, is the, um, the head of uh, the field station. And, uh, and I was going to go with Jim on the boat to get get samples and all these things um but that none of that happened um but i started i started uh taking notes on what this you know i wanted to do a short comic about the field station so i started taking notes about it after talking to these scientists and finding all, all these connections between art and science and uh and when you read the comic you know it, it's that's sort of mentioned in there um and i was just about to take some references to draw from and all that and then suddenly it was, uh, it was the hottest night up there, and it was very hot, and there was no AC, so I would run the fans all night. And at, like, midnight, my fans turned off. And I was like, oh, of all the nights, it's so hot here. And, uh, and then, like, two hours later, it's like, collect everything valuable and come to the main building. And I'm like, what? What's going on? Um, and... <laughs> It was, you know, like, so there's like 30 interns and they're all like, you know, everyone has these bags of like their most valuable possessions. And, you know, wondering what's in each of these bags, like what means, to, you know, for me, it was all like my laptop and my notebooks and anything that, that um, you know, the Fig Newtons didn't, didn't make the cut. And, uh, and we're all just tired and sleepy and eventually they're like, okay, we're not actually in danger. You can go back to your cabins and sleep. And then... Um, <laughs> And yeah, it was just, it was wild. It was, you know, and I've had to evacuate from fires before, so I wasn't really intimidated. I wasn't really scared. I knew that, you know, they were, they were very organized about it, and I knew that, that um, they would, they would uh, alert us if there was any actual emergency. And in the morning, they realized that power was out, so the septic wasn't working, and they couldn't keep food. You know, they had to feed all these interns, and they, they just couldn't run operations. So they, they relocated us all down to Missoula, um, the interns into the, the dorms. And they offered to do that for me as well, but um, but I was already like 
oh, they're they're getting rid of us. So I so I had talked with Sony already, and she's like, oh, there's this room with the other artists, and uh, yeah, there's this list. I imagine that I'll refer to at some point. Um, um, so it's uh, back to the original theme of what sort of defines us and what defines our experience is. I was expecting to be there for a month, you know, like writing and then making this short, like three little three page comic about my experience. Um, and, uh, and you can hold on to that and be frustrated and be anxious and all that. But, but why not say like, you know, the, the interns were amazing. I was on the, they put me on the food plan. It was very generous. And, um, and I, so I got to know all the interns and I, I was slowly learning, learning their names, and um, and you know they had this like early twenty-something grad student energy. They're all like trying to decide, like I'm gonna finish school. What am I gonna do with my life? Where am I gonna go next? And it was just, it was amazing. Um, but uh, but also a real strength I found. I've been to a few artist residencies. Is is like interacting with the other artists and being able to talk shop, being able to talk like, what's your motivation? Why are you doing these things? And so. When I was like, oh, I'm gonna be in the house with the other artists, like, great, <laughs> like this is fabulous, you know, like it's it's, of course I'm, you know, it's not like I'm like, oh, forget about them, like uh, that was a great experience too, but I was like, that's no longer a viable option. Here's where I'm going, and uh, and just being able to redefine internally what this residency was for me, um, and uh, and to be excited about it, like view it as an adventure. And, uh, and it has been an adventure. Um, I spent several days with the comic, which I had already you know, figured out the arc of it. And then I was like, well, the fire is kind of irrelevant. <laughs> like, you know, cause it's sort of an auto bio of like me being up there. And I was like, well, and so how do I, how do I rewrite it? And I, you know, I was very attached to what I had written. So again, this theme, I was like, I want to structure it how I structured it. And after like, a day of just hitting my head against a wall, I restructured it and then restructured it again, 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 again. And finally, I think the flow is as good. And I think it sort of represents um, my experiences and my feelings about it. Um, and, and yeah, and then um, I'm actually here for another week and they're going to relocate me theoretically to the dorms. Um, that's been the plan. Now that they're sort of opening up, maybe they'll put me there. Uh, I don't think the, field, the food plan is going to go back up because I don't think they bring the interns up, so it probably won't happen. And also, it was kind of awesome. So, you know, it's kind of, and I've already finished this comic, so I'm fine either way. Whatever happens, just, just like, wherever I am, I finish the comic so I can go back to writing. And I'm just going to be writing and taking notes for my last week. And, um, and I, I, can really, I can really do that wherever. Um, uh, okay, time. Um, uh, so, so fine, I expect wasn't for. Um, so uh, comics. Um, comics is a really interesting field. I don't know if it really how it overlaps with the fine art field is kind of complex. Like there aren't a lot of trailblazers here. Um, and uh, so uh, comics and the comics have sort of they've they've developed in different ways around the world. The most Famous are sort of the U.S. and and Europe and then Japan. Um, Europe and Japan, like they just made comics, and it was like any other medium, and it developed and grew. And um, for the last you know hundred years or so, in the U.S., uh, it was really interesting and weird. And then in the 50s, during McCarthyism, they came up with the Comics Code, which basically um, they uh, they choked distribution of anything that wasn't for kids. So comics were all these superheroes and funny comics, and nothing of any deep con concepts, no, um, you know, they just, uh, you couldn't do anything outside of that, really. Um, and there were amazing artists who worked in the medium and pushed those boundaries um, for what they were worth, um, but still those boundaries remained until around the 80s, um, uh, like Art Crumb out of San Francisco, and um, you know they started doing other distribution things to head shops and things like that, and and um, and Mouse by Art Spiegelman, and uh, other comics started to find their ways in until comic book stores were like, oh, we can sell other things, and they started demanding these from the distributors, and new distributors popped up, and the comics code went away, 
And so comics just suddenly went, went wild. Like all these interesting, very creative things because no one had done all this stuff. It was like this, this, it was in, um, yeah, it was a comic that was stuck in the 50s. And, um, and then the internet came about and then suddenly you didn't have to be published by a publisher. And so it wasn't just white guys doing comics anymore, not to say that was the only thing, there were exceptions, um, but that was largely what it was. And, uh, and suddenly anyone can publish web comics. And then recently, um, large publishers, like my book, that, um, my book which I did with uh, uh, Shane and Garrity, who's an amazingly funny cartoonist, um, uh, was picked up by uh, Simon and & Schuster. And they've, they've, uh, they've realized that middle grade graphic novels can like sell like hotcakes. Um, there was recently an article in uh, France where the government's like, well, we want people in like their 20s and stuff to like get more art and culture in their life. And they gave them all a certain amount of money and uh, they all spend it on comics. So <laughs> it's the future. <laughs> no, it's the future. Um, movies, all, you know, all the big movies now they're based on comics. It's sort of, we're, we're taking over. So um, it's, uh, um, but also there's another side to that. You know, there's a, there's a joke among cartoonists, like how do you, how can you tell there's a successful cartoonist? And that's if there's a movie made of their work. And the joke being like, it no longer has anything to do with the comics. It's a totally different medium. Like comics itself, you can't be successful. Um, and there just isn't, there isn't a lot of money. There isn't, it's, um, you know, I've managed to do it full time for about 10 years and it's still always a struggle, but I'm passionate about it and love it and um, want to stay with it. Um, and, uh, and so I've been very interested from the beginning because I wanted to tell stories that I wasn't seeing. And, um, and it's, uh, and you know, and there, there are definitely, um, you know, the people, you know, I made a list here, Tilly Walden and Dylan Horrocks and Craig Thompson, Alison Bechtel, Marjane Sotrapi, Joanne Safar, like people who are doing these experimental, beautiful work, um, a lot of them foreign because they didn't have the comics code to hold them back. Um, but, uh, but they talk about, like, I don't want to say real emotion, because it's not like superheroes and stuff don't have real emotion. It's not like that they can't express real things. But for me, emotions and life experience is sort of a quiet thing. It's not punching other people in spandex. Like, it's just sort of, it's, it's, uh, um, and so I wanted to tell that story, and a lot of it I've had to learn and invent myself because I just didn't see it out there. And, um, and that's been a huge inspiration. It's like being able, like in the fine arts field, it's like, it's sort of like, oh, what hasn't been done? It's, it's, I know a lot of artists who really struggle to find something that hasn't been done. And in comics, it's sort of like, whatever I think of, like half of it hasn't been done. And so it's, uh, so it's, a, it's a playground. Um, and, um, so, uh, um, 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 how it ties into the fine arts field is really complex. Um, most of you are probably familiar with Lichtenstein, who took like panels of comics and made them big, and, and you know, women crying on the phone, and airplanes going poom and blowing each other up. And um, but uh, what? Comics is very closely tied to narrative. Um, it's uh, another term for it is sequential art because you have it's a sequence. And um, and so Lichtenstein wasn't really saying a lot about comics. I don't feel. I feel he was saying a lot about the print media and the um, the commercialism of it. Um, and uh, and so so I don't find a lot of lot there. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's like when I got here and I was like, how do I write what I don't know? You know, it's like, how do I create something that is more, that has one foot in the, the arts world? And it's not, it's not really a goal as much as it's, it seems to make sense to me. And so I've just wanted to explore it. And um, Stoney mentioned that I did a comic about the, uh, about Glens Falls, New York, upstate New York, um, that I got through a New York State's arts grant. Um, and it, I lived in this town, and there were just a scrappy bunch of people, and they had, there's like all these museums and historic archives in town, and they're just kind of amazing. And I wanted to create a comic about it that really showcased it, where people could read it and enjoy it, but also, like I actually interviewed and transcribed 
the interviews of, of the people who ran and worked at these organizations so that I could um, really faithfully represent sort of conversationally what they were about. And, um, and so I did a lot of research on, um, on uh, you know, oral, oral tradition and narrative because I wasn't looking for the spiel that's on their website. I was looking like people who work there, how would they define their histories, their goals of the organization? And so I was trying to balance all these things and sort of create something new and also make it entertaining on some level um, because I want people to read it and be like, oh, geez, I really want to visit Glens Falls, New York. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and so, uh, you know, several years ago I was invited to, um, to say 10 Field Station and I uh, wanted to do a comic about an experience and uh, the, my experience there and sort of tried to make it somewhat poetic not really like it's it's how do how to capture something that's more than simply the experience and I think I think a lot of artists think about this theme um, it's uh, like I'm, I'm a very good painter I you know got myself in the um, uh, I can do uh, very lifelike portraits and that's representation and that's skill you can you know you know, spend enough time, you can learn to tie your shoe, spend a few years on it, you can be really good at tying your shoe. Same thing with, like, painting. And, and, and um, so, you know, learning to draw or paint something that's representative of what you see is sort of the first level. But what beyond that are you trying to do? And for me, it was really I wanted to capture the essence of the person, something that felt that came through where you're not just, it doesn't just look like, oh, that's a human being, but like, that's a person. I can really get a sense of them. And, um, and so that's, you know, that's what I struggled with this comic that, that I passed out was, I didn't want to be like, oh, I talked to some scientists and learned some stuff and that was really interesting and we evacuated. And, um, you know, I wanted to put in analogies. I wanted to give the feel of it while also giving, uh, making the reader somewhat feel, I don't know, kind of excited and elated and and um, and engaged and also sympathetic. And I wanted to I wanted to really really um, touch on the experience of, of reading it. Um, and uh, and yeah, um, it's I don't know. I was uh, I was I was I was talking with uh, Maria earlier, um, and uh, and I was like, what, what, what do artists talk about? And she's like, oh, uh, form, concept, and function. And I was like, oh, OK. Well, that sort of makes sense. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think about these things when I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's sort, of, that sort of sums it up. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so I wrote this down. I didn't have press at desk or again. And, um, and uh, so for form, I, I, you know, I drew this with a paintbrush. I largely work digitally, but I really like the tactile feeling of working with a brush. Um, the lettering is done with a, um, with a fiber tip pen. And um, I forgot to bring my Ames lettering guide. Is how, that's how you put in lines for lettering, um, sort of tool of the trade. I forgot to bring a ruler, like, like pretty essential stuff. Um, and, uh, but I was thinking about, uh, there's this cartoonist Claus Schoenfeld who um, isn't particularly remarkable. He did this comic called Kelvin Mace. He did one issue and it was a cliffhanger. And then he like went to Norway or something, I forgot where, and he forgot to bring anything. So we just got some paper and like washes. And it's like, the second comic was so lush and pretty. And because, and he's like, sorry, I didn't have like zip -a -tone. I didn't have all this stuff, but like, it was kind of amazing, and it was a totally new story. He didn't even bring a copy of the first issue, so he didn't know where he had left off. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so I was reminded of that, like, and then again, the theme, like, normally I work with these tools. Normally, this is how I do it, and I'm like, I don't have these tools, and so I found workarounds, and and it was uh, and it was exciting, and it was like, when I was a kid, I didn't have these tools, so it brought me back to a bit of like when I used to make comics as a kid, and that felt really good. I was like. This is just feels very handmade, and it made me very happy. Um, that's form. Um, um, so uh, the uh, concept. Why did I write that there? I sort of arranged them. Um, the concept um, was 
uh, which brings back to, uh, in the comic it talks about how I was trying to make connections between science and Earth's experience, and the scientists, how like, when you're doing an experiment, you come up with a theory, and then you kind of like form the experiment, but your end goal isn't your theory. Like, you have to sort of throw your theory to the wind, because the end might not prove your theory, it might disprove it. Like, it's, it's basically you have a sort of guideline going in, but then you have to go with where it takes you, like this resonancy. Um, and, uh, and so this comic was very much like this. I went in knowing I wanted to do something that represented my experience there, and tried to represent the work that they did there. And, um, and I only got like two panels worth of that. Um, of the work they did there, um, but my experience changed, and so, so, um, so I really had to work, you know, go with that, and um, and the rest of the concept is sort of what I was talking about, about conveying something more beyond just a uh, story, um, and then the uh, the function is uh, function. It's it's weird because you know comics are a commercial art largely, um, you know, like I won't make any money off of this, so what defines commercial. Like, if you don't make money, is it still a commercial art? You know, um, but, uh, but so I'm used to thinking about like, what will a reader think? Or when I'm doing freelance, what will a client think? And that's really important because I need to make a living. I need to continue being able to do this thing. And so you try to balance it. You're like, well, how much can I get away with putting myself in here? And also, please the audience, please the, um, please the uh, client. and. That's another reason why residencies are so special. Um, I got to create this without having to think about selling it, without having to think about the um, commercial aspect. Um, but that said, I still think about things. I think about like how people read it. I want it to be cohesive. I want it to be able to be enjoyed and appreciated um, um, while also putting in things that maybe people don't even realize are going on. Um, um, there's a lot of like, cinematographic <laughs> techniques that um, are used in comics that are very subtle and most people don't even realize that, that they're happening. And, um, and the other thing is uh, I found, I realized on this residency that this work and the, and the comic I did about Sage and Field Station and the comic I did about Glens Falls, New York are all a love letter and it's, um, which is part of who I am. I, I really appreciate opportunities that I'm given. I really appreciate the hard work people, everyone at the workstation, at the field station really worked hard to make me comfortable to create this space. Uh, Stoney is amazing that she set up this program that allows us to come and work. And, um, and I want to show that appreciation. And so, although I'm not trying to do this to sell the Stony or to sell the field station. There is no commercial. It's still, it's a, it's a love letter to this opportunity and, my, and to expression of my appreciation of it.